Welcome back to the channel. The contents of this video may be alarming to some people, but it is something that ultimately we all need to talk about. And that is UK's digital identity and attributes trust framework. Now, many of you will be alarmed at the very idea of a digital identity because naturally many people don't want their information in any kind of digital form being given away around as some kind of ID card. Now, spoiler alert for later in the video, there are no plans for the UK government to issue digital identity cards, although that's not to say it will never happen. But there is also what is often referred to as the privacy paradox here, whereby lots of people say that they don't want their information to be disseminated, shared around across the internet and with other people. And yet at the same time, they do use uh, Facebook and various other social media platforms to share photographs and all sorts of personal information. So one might question uh, whether or not there is a real uh, sense of retaining that privacy across all of their personal data. That aside, I wanted to run through a few things in this UK Digital Identity and Attributes Trust framework, which has been out for consultation a number of times. In fact, it's been out for a number of consultations and it's been modified a couple of times. So shifting across to that UK Digital Identity, um, let's look a little bit first of all on the ministerial foreword about this. Now, um, as you can see here, the consultation um, on the legislation and governance needed to underpin um, is, is of paramount here. Um, so it says here, uh, we've taken on board the feedback from the online survey that accompanied the publication of the alpha version. This has been bolstered by extensive engagement sessions across the public and private sectors, civil society and other experts. Other experts, of course, include uh, data protection experts and people of that um, line of work. The result of this is the updated version today, which has expanded uh, the, to detail the approach to certification, clarifies intentions, relationships, and so on. So what is a digital identity? So let's take a look at what a digital identity really is in this context. In the context of this trust framework, a digital identity is a digital representation of a person acting as an individual or as a representative of an organization. Now, just pausing on that for a moment, um, there are lots of comments that I've seen fly around. What is a person? Who is a person? And these kind of things. So when you hear these arguments on social media videos, a person, you know what a person is uh, or who a person is. There's no special legal jargon as to a person and a corporate identity, as in you, the person, being a corporate identity. A person is a person, a human being, a, a live, living person who is identifiable and obviously registered at birth, presuming everything's uh, gone to plan and everyone's been registered properly. So don't get hung up on the words person as a, uh, an identity here. So moving back to this document, a digital identity product and service developed under the trust framework not the same as a centralized identity database or digital ID card. In fact, something we'll come on to later is the government's attitude to a, a digital ID card. The trust framework will enable users to choose a range of services created by different organizations that use different technologies to meet diverse user needs. So when might you need a digital identity. Well, you might want to prove who you are for all sorts of reasons. And moving away from the typical name, date of birth, your address, and try to confirm bits of your bank statements and things like that to prove who you are. Some of these organizations might want to prove who you are. You might want to prove who you are without going through all of those steps. So you would essentially have a digital identity with which you can prove all of that. Anyone can choose to create one or more digital identities. A user may choose to have different digital identities to use in different contexts. So you might have more than one digital identity to use in a different context with a different company for a different purpose. For example, they do not have to create a digital identity They would, if they would prefer not to. So it's an optional thing. You have the option of creating a digital identity for different purposes. Sometimes digital identities will be created for just one type of transaction at a specific point in time. 
So you may, may create this identity for maybe a one-off use. You're creating it specifically for a purpose. You use that service, that company service, or you use that identity for one purpose, and then you delete or destroy the digital identity. And it provides some examples. So example, Cliff needs to prove his identity to apply for a loan online. Doing this creates a digital identity. He can use this digital identity to complete his application, open an account, and he cannot use it for to do anything else. Others will be reusable. So Peggy is buying her first home. She creates a digital identity, then checks a credit score online with the credit scoring agency. This credit, credit scoring agency is a participant of the scheme in a trust framework. Uh, she decides to apply for a mortgage from a bank. The bank is also a participant of the scheme in the trust framework. This means she can use the digital identity again to apply for the mortgage. So she's gone through the steps necessary to prove who she is, created this digital identity. It's obtained her credit score. She's used it to apply for the mortgage from the bank. She then needs to prove who she is several times throughout the process of buying a house. For example, uh, different uh, bits of insurance, maybe an indemnity insurance, maybe uh, for any of the building regulations, correspondence and prove who she is to obtain those bits of information. Um, perhaps even with her own uh, lawyers. And as it says here, um, estate agents and solicitors. Uh, she can do this online, uh, or if she has any of these interactions happen in real life, she can show her digital identity using an app on her phone presumably with some form of QR code, which will create uh, a link to this digital identity so she can prove who she is. And whether or not it's reusable, will rely on the organizations agreeing to work together and use this identity. So this is a little bit like multiple organizations working together. In this example, solicitors could work with the credit scoring agencies, can work with the mortgage, companies can work with the estate agents and perhaps any other insurance providers and so on and so forth. They work together in a network. They can identify who somebody is with this digital identity and prove who they are. And it can be reusable for all those times and then potentially could be deleted or potentially retained for future use. For example, renewing or fixing a mortgage with the mortgage company later on, reusing the solicitor moving forwards, because of course lawyers have periods of time within which they, they must retain uh, information about clients. So this uh, Peggy here may wish to retain the services of, of the solicitor in the future and therefore keep alive this digital identity. Remembering that you don't have to create one of these digital identities, at least not yet. Um, using digital identities will mean users do not have to rely on manual processes such as post or over the phone. This, I have to say, based on videos I've done recently, is potentially a very good step in the right direction. Currently, we do rely very heavily on Royal Mail on the post. Now, I've read all of your comments about um, discrediting Royal Mail and the pressures that Royal Mail's under and no one else wants to deliver standard mail and it's down to Royal Mail to do that. All of that's fine. But at the same time, mail does go missing. Now, in fact, we had a conversation with the, the local postman and said it's the sorting office that sort them into little piles. And the address on the top is the address into which all of that little pile goes. So if there are two or three items underneath that, then they go to the wrong address. So we've received invoices, bank statements, and all of these sorts of things that have been addressed to somebody else, to a different address. So anyone in receipt of all of that information, if they were nefarious, would be able to take that information and create uh, an identity and essentially steal that identity. That's essentially how identity theft works. Enough information to be able to convince another organization that you are them. For example, name, address, birth date, all of these kind of things are going to help somebody to pretend that they are that person. But if they have their bank details, that's going to be even easier because who would have your bank details? So the mere fact that we've received mail invoices and bank statements that are intended for somebody else has given us that information. As I said, somebody acting nefariously, criminally to steal somebody's identity with that information is going to be much more able to do that. Now, the concern that I would have here is if someone has access somehow to this digital identity, then someone is going to be even more likely, more able 
to pretend to be another person, particularly if they're doing that online. So if that is somehow compromised, because any form of digital access is going to have a threshold of comparability, which means that at some point it is possible that somebody could break in and hack and steal and use your digital identity one way or another. There will of course be safeguards in place and I will look a great deal more at those at another time. Uh, just moving to what this document says the benefits are for users, being able to share the digital identity and attributes with different organizations between users, make it easy to choose and complete interactions and transactions digitally. Um, there are obviously um, what's referred to here as a table of standards and guidance and rules for service providers. So there's obviously going to be a great deal that they will need to comply with uh, to make this safe, to make it fair, and of course comply with the law. Now, to come to the question that lots of you are going to ask, and lots of you are going to be concerned about is, um, what is the government's overall attitude towards having some kind of compulsory digital identity card? Now, here it says, many individuals who responded to the consultation said they were against digital identities in principle, meaning many people took the time to respond to this consultation to say, we don't like the idea. So perhaps you could let me know in the comments below, do you like the idea of a digital identity to replace standard methods such as your name, date of birth, ad address, bank details and things like that, and instead have some kind of digital identity which you will prove in some other way? Or are you just ag outright against it in principle? The government says here, the government has heard this and has no plans to make use of digital identities com uh, compulsory. The government also understands that there's no public support for ID cards in the UK and has no plans to introduce ID cards. This is another notion that's circulated fairly widely. The idea of a national ID card, a di whether a digital one or a physical one or otherwise, um, the proposals brought forward in this document will not require the introduction of ID cards. They're limited instead of creating trust and confidence in digital methods of providing identity and eligibility. This means that when it suits people to prove things about themselves or others on the basis of a digital identity, this can be achieved with as much ease and security as is offered by physical proofs of identity such as a passport. Now, as I said earlier, there's always a threshold of comparability, however secure something is supposed to be. And at the moment, whilst uh, I'm not going to cast personal views on the use of digital identities or ID cards for that matter, with the threshold of comparability as against the current method, which is sending something out in the post, which we know is a fairly common occurrence to get lost and end up in the wrong hands. There is obviously a clear choice between the two here. Which one do you use? Now, just recently I've had conversations with people who've tried to uh, prevent their bank from sending out um, various statements and annual statements and things of that nature to the home address and instead do them only online. And in many of those cases, and some of you have written to me and, and said, the banks have refused and they, they insist that it comes out by post. But if you know that you've got problem with the post and let's say you live in a block and the notoriously uh, the post men and women just can't find your particular flat or apartment or house within the complex or whatever it might be, then you sort of stuck, you have no choice because many of these banks are refusing to move some of those documents uh, purely online and insist that they come out by post. Now in that case, if they are insisting they come out by post and they get lost, then you are of course potentially opened up to identity theft and there's nothing you can do about it, save change your bank for one that uh, will allow everything online and uh, cut off any postal services. Moving to this other page here, this is from techhq.com, uh, just reporting on it, just to show you that there is a uh, public discussion about this. Quoting, the UK government's committed to ensuring digital identities are not compulsory, people will still be able to use online paper documentation. Data Minister Julie Lopez noted that the government is committed to unlocking the power of data to benefit people across the UK, and the legislation proposing will ensure that uh, there are trusted and secure ways for people and organizations to use digital identities should they choose to. 
Now the emphasis is there clearly on having the choice to use a digital identity and that the current attitude is that they're not compulsory. But as we all know, things can change, things do sometimes change, and it may well be that at some point in the future, a compulsory ID card is rolled out. Whether or not you play ball with that and cooperate and, and enlist for one will be a matter for you. Uh, if you were in doubt about that, you would of course be encouraged to seek legal advice. Uh, but as it stands, the government's position is that there is not a plan uh, for a compulsory ID card or compulsory use of digital identities. Many of you doubtless will think it's a great idea and potentially an equal number of you um, or perhaps many more of you may think that this is a terrible idea and that you shouldn't be committing your personal data to any kind of digital identity. But I would leave you with the thought that if that being the case, why would you ever use a social media platform uh, for your personal photographs, locations and personal information and all of those kind of things? Uh, all of which is up for debate, all of which is up for comment and discussion. Uh, I invite you to put those in the comment box below. Um, but I hope you found this interesting because I've had a couple of you mention this before now. Um, it crossed my desk again this morning. So I thought I would do a very quick video on this uh, to have a quick discussion on it. So let me know what you think. Uh, please do remember to like this video and subscribe. That always helps my channel grow. Um, I really appreciate that. And I re appreciate you sending me messages to tell me uh, that these videos have helped you in some way or another. And in the meantime, thank you for watching.